check, one, two. Hey, one, two. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Check, check, one, two. One, two, final test, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four.
laser cooling and the Bose-Einstein condensate. I had not paid much attention. Okay, dark. Testing, one, two.
So I see uh, Bill Brinkman has arrived in Bell Labs time, <laughs> which was always uh, five minutes after the nominal meeting time. So we're about to get started. As you see, Art has arrived on his chariot, which uh, I am told we had to, uh, we had to uh, lock it in first gear because it was already speedy enough in first gear. In second and third gears, uh, there was no guarantee he would ever arrive here, at least not in one piece. So he's arrived, and Rene is just getting him started. So I'll just run through a little bit and make some introductory remarks about what we're going to do today. Uh, it's obviously a fantastic day for Bell Labs, I think. Uh, this is the fourth Nobel Prize that I've been here, uh, and, and we get to celebrate uh, since I've been here. Not that, that my presence here matters at all, but I was trying to work out if there was a series. So we did uh, 97, 98. The 98, of course, should have been arts, but we'll gloss over that. Uh, so 1998, then we did 2014, Betsig, and now art, uh, 2018. I was trying to work out if there was a series. Uh, and there, if you ignore the chemistry one, then there's actually a series of 97, 98, skip chemistry, 2018, and so that would say the next Nobel Prize is 2019. I think that's the series I want to see in, in the data. Um, but honestly... It, the thing to realize is that Bell Labs uh, changes, but doesn't change as much as people like to believe in, in sort of popular press. I think we've always had this goal of solving the grand challenges and uh, confront humanity. But when we find those things, we then go deeply enough to invent new techniques, methods, theories, systems that actually solve for them. And we still do that today. So although we've changed parents quite a bit, Back in the day, uh, when you started, what was the name of the company? What was the parent company? The Western Electric or AT&T? So AT&T. So I started in AT&T. No, system hadn't been built in at that point. There you go. So it was still the old the 47 Bell Systems. The 48 operating company, one in every state. And I was still uh, in the old AT&T. There was a you Bell Corp. You were probably in uh, kit by that time. I was as a baby. <laughs> I was a baby. Uh, but when I joined, it was the, uh, the regional operating companies, but it was still an AT&T. And then, of course, that became uh, Lucent uh, shortly after I joined, and then Alcatel, Lucent, and now Nokia. But the interesting part is, although the parents changed, uh, the goal of Bell Labs and the support for Bell Labs really hasn't changed. The goal is always to look and for those big problems confronting humanity. And let's face it, today there are a lot of problems uh, confronting humanity. But then at the core of that is, of course, an ability to communicate. In fact, you could argue that most of what we experience today is uh, perhaps an impaired communication. So uh, I think in this era uh, that's ahead of us, we've got a lot of work still to do, a lot of great innovation, a lot of Nobel Prizes. This is number nine, but you know, I'd like to get to, I don't know, 20. Uh, so we have plenty of space left in this garden. But today is all about art. He did tell me one story. Uh, that I liked uh, just a moment ago, that back in 52, when he, he uh, started in Murray Hill uh, and then moved down to Holmdel, he said uh, they had a badging system. And the badging system you know, was new in those days. You had to show the badge to the security guard to get in. He said, except for the big shots. The big shots, they had to recognize your face uh, so as not to offend your presidential sensibility. I will uh, let it be known that is not the system today. <laughs> I have to scan in like everyone else, and I, I rather like that. But uh, that was how it was back in the day. So, but today is all about art. In fact, we're going to have, you're wondering here, a bit of art for art. That's my one joke. <laughs> it's going to actually be art tech for art. As you may know, we've uh, reactivated the Experiments in Art and Technology program of Bell Labs that started in the 60s. So we're going to have a piece that's dedicated to art uh, by Schubert, and you'll hear more about that later on. But all I'm here to say is what a fantastic Bell Labs day, what a fantastic uh, honor to have art here and have him give his uh, Nobel laureate address. And without any further ado, I am just going to kick off a set of congratulatory videos from those former Nobel laureates that will play out. And then at the end of that, René uh, René Jean Essayombre, who actually went to Stockholm and gave Art's address and is a close friend of Art and a current Bell Labs researcher, he will then take the stage and uh, make some introductory remarks about Art before Art himself 
takes the helm, and then we'll, uh, we'll have the musical performance wrap up and go to lunch. Does that all sound good? Welcome. Thanks very much indeed. I was very pleased when I heard about your Nobel Prize. While I had followed the physics applications of optical manipulation of particles, including laser cooling and the Bose-Einstein condensate, I had not paid much attention to the biological applications of optical tweezers. I found the ability to measure small things like investigating molecular motors particularly interesting. Congratulations, Art, for starting many new lines of endeavor and now receiving a well-deserved Nobel for it. Welcome to the club. It's nice to have you in it. And uh, it's good to be here with you as one of your fellow members. Uh, I am delighted to be able to welcome you. Art, this is Steve Chu. I give you my most enthusiastic and warmest congratulations on such a well-deserved Nobel Prize. Way, way later than it should have been, but I think of how your work in elucidating forces that light can exert on atoms and particles, how you pioneered many of the things that have really opened up many fields in physics, in biology, and beyond. And how wonderful it was, and such an honor to have worked with you and collaborated with you, and how you altered the career of many scientists, mine included. And again, my very best wishes and congratulations. Very sad that I won't be seeing you here in Stockholm on December 10th. But nevertheless, congratulations. Hello, Art. Congratulations to finally being honored in this way. I know, it took the Nobel Committee a little while to figure this one out and set it straight, but they did it, and it's just wonderful having seen it happen. I'm very sorry that I cannot come to Bell Labs and help celebrate. I'm out of the country. But I'm sure they're going to throw you a memorable party. So all I can say is go ahead and enjoy this great recognition to its fullest. Ciao. So that's my pleasure to be here to introduce uh, Art for, to give his uh, Nobel lectures. Um, the clicker. So I'm going to talk a little bit about his origins, his work, uh, the Nobel Prize itself, and the Nobel Week. So this is uh, the father and the mother of Art, Isadore and Anna. Ashkenazi, 
Um, Is- Isador uh, immigrated uh, to the U.S. from Odessa, which was at the time part of uh, Tsarist Russia. That's at the turn of the last century. Uh, Anna was born in Poland. And Isador arrived at Ellis Island. And there they actually changed his name from Ashkenazi to Ashken to make it more American. <laughs> and uh, Isador was a dental mechanic. And here's his siblings. So that's uh, his brother Julius, his uh, sister Ruth. Yeah, in the middle, <laughs> Julius is in the middle, of course, and uh, Anna, his mother. Uh, maybe you may not know this, but uh, Julius was a very renowned well physicist. Uh, he worked on the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos with Feynman. He worked with him afterwards. He was a very uh, uh, smart uh, individual, like Art. So Art uh, has the three children, uh, Michael, Judy, and Daniel. And um, so I had the pleasure to meet the three of them, and i uh, very happy I did. Um, and um, they have actually, uh, uh, Art has uh, five grandchildren. So let's talk a little bit about uh, his work and his uh, history. So Art was born in Brooklyn uh, as a bachelor. He actually started a bachelor degree in Columbia University, but he was actually uh, stopped by the war. He was drafted to, uh, t- in the army. So he actually served his time as a technician at the radiation lab at Columbia University, where he worked on high-power pulse magnetron for radars. So magnetron seems a fancy name, but that's what we have in our microwaves. And uh, so everybody's using that every day. So as part of the GI Bill, he actually it enabled him to do his PhD degree at uh, Cornell University, where he graduated in 52. And then he joined Bell Lab directly. Oh, so <laughs> Art is telling me that the, the, the building there at Columbia University is Pupin Hall, which is the physics department at the time. That's where he, he studied. His office is somewhere, I think, on the 13th floor of that building. <laughs> Oh, yeah. He, he almost pointed out the window, actually. <laughs> um, then when he joined Bell Lab, he joined Bell Lab in Murray Hill in 52. He worked on electron tubes for communication. Uh, then he switched to lasers in 1962, so two years after the laser was demonstrated. And then he started to work on radiation pressure at the end of the 60s. Here's a video of the 70s. I hope it works. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if it works. It doesn't, it doesn't work. But that was a short video. Is this place playing here? Okay. So that's a short video where. Um, uh, we see a, a laser that uh, Art is playing with, with the, is changing the focus length to uh, uh, make a particle levitate. So you will see the particle that levitates ups and down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, there was smoke. Yeah. Art is saying that there was smoke there, so that we'd be able to see the beam, and uh, more clearly. So they would put the smoke in the lab <laughs> for that. And, and uh, so then... This is, this is a lens. I have a replay. I have some footage in here for you guys to see. Joe is going to like this, but uh, let me show. I think... Well... Do you want to do that a bit later, or? This comes out of my cell. Oh, wow, I didn't my know that. My cell, I took all my equipment with me. <laughs> That's the equipment that he Yeah, because he when I left, okay. <laughs> uh, our director, Rich Howard at the time, he said, uh, uh, if you don't take it, we'll put it in a dumpster. 
and uh, someone's going to take it and re redo it and make a lot of money, you might as well take it home. Otherwise, we're throwing it out. So I took everything except a really big laser because I didn't have <laughs> 220 <laughs> volts in my, uh, in my cellar or water to run the uh, argon laser. But the thing is, this is levitation. This is a lens, this is a loop lens. Mm. Rene says it's not loupe, but loop. This is a French. loop. Then the beam comes here, you can see it a little bit. Uh, it's, oh, it's <laughs> on the picture. You know, I actually wrote a book that's very heavy. This is it. <laughs> and, and this is a picture. That's, that's the loop on a tube. Joe Smoke, illuminating the light, <laughs> hits a prism. This is, a, this is a, a rod holding the prism. Then it comes up. It passes through uh, a piezoelectric because this particle was sitting on the bottom surface, sticking by Van der Waals force. And we would, through these wires, <laughs> We would hit the hit thing with a pulse, the par particle would jump up, and once it was free, it, we could lift it up, and there's the particle, okay, in a box. And you, I don't know if you can see these little stripes here, but uh, uh, do, is there one that shows the uh, me scattering? No, it is not. Jo no. No. Let's go to the next one. See what <laughs> So that's, this one is about the Nobel Prize, but... Yeah, okay, but we skip that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not okay. exactly I think my... Uh, we all I know look. that we are here for the Nobel Prize ceremony. Then um, I wanted to share a discussion I had with you on, on uh, October 2nd. <laughs> so so uh, Art received a phone call on October 2nd at uh, 5.40, a.m., of course, that announced that he had the Nobel Prize. And... Um, then I called Art at 7.50 when I learned about it uh, to congratulate him, but he did not answer. Then at 11.54, he calls me back. So he has a few sentences that he said, and that, this one is the first one. He said, irony, sorry I didn't return your call earlier. I received a lot of phone calls this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see he's, he's very, always very polite. <laughs> And then a few minutes later, we talked about the Nobel Prize. And then he said, do you think Bell Labs knows that I received the Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> I told him, yeah, I think they do. <laughs> and then the uh, last one, which really shows a, a real scientist, said, you know, Rene, I think the paper I want to submit to science has a much better chance to be accepted now that I received the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> This is the picture. Of the, I don't know if you can see it, of the me scattering. These are, this is a big card, and Joe and I would just hold it over the particle. The particle was a little glass bead. And we bought some cheap beads, but anyway, we were <laughs> levitating them. And then you could see all these rings. The whole room was filled with me scattering. And, uh, well, later on, we took some some scans of this thing, and I think that with a laser, and that was some of the most, Im mo the most precise measurements ever made of light scattering up to that time. Before that, you used you know, an ordinary uh, flashlight, and uh, it was a mess. So <laughs> this, was, this, was, this was pretty important. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, just, just to mention, of course, that Art is not alone to have won the Nobel Prize. There are two others, and uh, uh, Gerard Mourou and Dora Strickland, who won for the high-power uh, uh, laser application, and Art, of course, for the optical tweezer. Okay. Yeah. So the Nobel Week. Uh, so the Nobel Prize is uh, many events. It actually lasts six days or so. And... Um, some, so I'm just going to highlight a few of the main events. One of the main events is the Nobel Lecture itself. So it's half an hour lecture. And uh, Art uh, honored me by asking me to deliver it in, in his uh, 
on his behalf. But of course, we prepared it together. I think we had like 10 or 12 meetings about this uh, few hours <laughs> each uh, to work on the slides together. And um, then uh, on the same day, there is a Nobel Prize concert. That's in the concert hall of Stockholm. It has a capacity of about 1,700 people. Then, uh, two days later, there is the Nobel Prize Award Ceremony where the king of Sweden uh, uh, gave the, uh, officially the Nobel Prize Award. And uh, since Art could not be there, his son Michael uh, received the, uh, the award for uh, Art. And then this is the, uh, the diploma, the Nobel Prize diploma. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it's still, <laughs> it's still in Stockholm. It's actually stayed there for an entire week, and they're going to ship it. <laughs> and um, okay, and uh, on that same day where the award is being uh, given by the king, uh, there is a Nobel banquet. In, in um, it's actually at the uh, Stockholm City Hall, but it's really. A, like a castle, a castle, and it has like a, a few thousand people capacity. So it's a very big banquet with dances and, and so on. And um, there are other events oh, afterwards. Oh. But uh, and then here are the uh, arts people. So uh, Joe Jedjic, who is sitting here, who worked with art. You want to step up? Stand up, Joe. Can I, say, Renee, can I say a few things? Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you know, you, yeah. Joe and I, uh, practically, uh, from the day go, he was, he was, he started out, I think, in the Navy, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. And he learned electronics in the Navy. And then he came to Bell Labs. And do you know who, who, he, who his first boss was? Jim Gordon, of the Gordon and Towns. Actually, uh, Hans Krusenweil. What? Hans Krusenweil. Oh, yeah, I, do, I didn't know that. He didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, afterwards, he and I joined up, and uh, after a couple of years, you got a bachelor's degree at Newark College of Engineering. Right. Uh, and then you became an AMTS, and then you became, well, well, I don't know whether they still have AMTS, Associate Member of Technical Staff. That's because you, oh, you, you weren't, didn't have a PhD. But not everybody had a PhD. Uh, yeah, I can't hear you, Joe. Yes, but then you became a member of technical staff. And uh, when he retired, uh, well, that was the end of an era. <laughs> so that, that, you know, Joe has been with me from time go. There's me. Now, you see that lens there? That's a, that's a little lens that I use for uh, reading things that I can't see too well. And I have... It's supposed to be in here. I have that very lens. I don't think it's there. Someone left it out. No, it's not there. You see it? No, it's not there. And it's not there. I would have brought okay. my jeweler's loop if you told well, me. Okay, I had that lens. I was going to hold it up like that. You and there's John Bjorkholm. Now, John Bjorkholm, he was the first guy I ever hired. Came from Stanford, a, sig a, s a student of Sigmund's. Okay. Fantastic experimenter, built ruby lasers way, way back. And then there's Roger Stolen. He was the second guy I ever hired. But you know, when I first came, well, I, I won't tell you exactly, but you know, when I first came, the only people, I inherited a department from Chief Cutler. The only people in my department were technicians. I was supposed to be a guy from Columbia who knew how to make things. So 
uh, when I came to Bell Labs, that's the, that's that's that. Well, when I got promoted, that was the, that was the group I had. But I hired John. I hired Roger. I hired, hired Eric Ippen, who later went to uh, MIT because his father was a, was a professor, full professor there of, I think, of uh, civil engineering. And of course, there's my wife, Arlene, who practically wrote this book with me. <laughs> she typed it seven times. Uh, I, you know, it took me almost 10 years to write that book. And it's that book I recommend to you. If you, if, well, I'm mean, you know, not, not, I got a very small percentage. <laughs> they sort of tricked me, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I was wanted to say is that half the book is commentary, the first half. I comment on every single paper that we ever wrote or import, what I consider important papers. And the second half contains the actual paper. So you can go look at that and, and read this stuff. So I think that's an important thing. Uh, so I think we can... Well, well, let's see. I could talk for an hour about but these guys. But okay. You can, because we're going to start the presentation. Yes, I got it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So we anyway, can switch. What, what do you want to say? So the presentation will start. Your, your uh, Nobel lecture will start. Okay, yeah. So. Well, do you want to start with this one, right? Uh, yeah, this this is the. Uh, yeah. So okay. I, I will click when you you want. Yeah, click now. Everyone is see. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, it says I have a fascination with the act. You know, I was I was a small kid. I was ten years old, and in our house, my father was a poor man during the depression. And the only book we had was the Book of Knowledge, because the salesmen used to come around and sell the Book of Knowledge. Okay, so my mother and father said, oh, you know, read the book and, uh, um, you know, you, you'll be smart in school. Well, in the Book of Knowledge, there was a section called Wonder Why. Wonder Why was a kid who asked, why is the sky blue? Then Wonder Why would tell you, okay? So I used to read these things, and uh, you know I learned a lot. But this, I also uh, misinterpreted a lot of it. Like Wonder Why said, "If you go up high, the air gets thinner." Well, out, I was out in the yard with my brother, and there's a our ladder. So I climbed up the ladder and I sniffed around, and I said to my brother Julie, "I said, you know, it doesn't smell any different to me." So he starts laughing. He says, you dope, you have to go to the stratosphere before you can get uh, the, the air gets thinner. So anyway, but the other thing is, there used to be a drugstore right nearby. Then they had a little radiometer. You know what? One of these things. And they shined a light on it, and it would spin. And this shows it here. It's a partial vacuum. You know, there are veins and shows the light. This is terrific. Uh, okay, can you see this? Yeah. One side is black and the other is silver. And when you shine the light on it, the black soft gets hot. There's a partial vacuum. So when the uh, uh, molecule lands on the black surface, it recoils. And it recoils and gets more. The, the, uh, the, uh, the silver side is just light pressure, which is very weak. So it spins like that, that arrow, OK? Well, OK. Whoa. This takes us to not, whoa, we'll go back to, oh, oh. Well, all I wanted to say is when, well, but this, we finish with this. It's, this is due to thermal effects because the, Black part is hotter than the other part. If you got rid of the air, I mean the partial vacuum, then it would go the other way. And you know something that actually happens. In 1900, the first time they figured out how to make a, high va a hard vacuum, they pumped it out. And the guys did famous experiments by Nichols and Hull. Nichols was the first 
the first president of the Optical Society. So he was a pretty important guy. And then Hull, I don't know if he was, they did it together. But in Russia, in Russia, where they always do something for the first time, there was a guy by the name of, uh, not Letokov, but Lebedev. Yeah, they have heard of the, he's the most famous scientist in all of the Soviet Union and Russia. And he was the guy in Russia who pumped out the air and saw the thing go like the green one, okay? So that's Lebedev. Okay. Ah, well, this takes us to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, magnetron when I, uh, when, I, when I was at the radiation lab, and uh, that, believe it or not, is a picture of me with all the hair. Okay, and I worked on magnetrons. Back in then, it was, magnetrons was for, I worked for, with Sid Millman. Sid Millman became, uh, well, he was a department head, then at Bell Labs he was a director. After the war, he came to Bell Labs. He was a director, and then he was the executive director. So Sid was my mentor. And he taught me how to make magnetrons. And he was the inventor of something called the rising sun magnetron. I, I have some, I, you know, you'll see some pictures of the rising sun. It looks like a, like, just like a rising sun, alternate cavities. But anyway, at the end of the war, after the Germans capitulated in, uh, in 45, uh, he said, let's build a really powerful uh, magnetron. I didn't know it, but it turned out that that magnetron that I built was the most powerful magnetron that had ever been built. With the rising sun, you could take the anode, you know, with the, 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 just the, the height that was generating, and you could double it or triple it. So I made a big one. I, I have a little museum in my house, I, I gave some, some magnetrons to the uh, Swedish Museum, but I didn't give that one. That one I kept <laughs> home. Anyway, uh, it put out a million watts. Do you believe a million watts? No. How could you have it? Because in the radar, you, you looked at pulses, and the pulses had a duty cycle of 1,000. So it wasn't a million watts, it was a kilowatt. A kilowatt of microwave back then was really, that was the t most powerful magnetron there was around. So I said to myself, what can you do with a million watts besides radar? Radar was pretty good. We won the war with radar. Not the atomic bomb, radar. Because the Germans came over and uh, uh, Spitfires would always meet them. And Marshall uh, Goering said, oh, in, they have an infinite number of airplanes. Let's leave them alone and we'll attack Russia. So that was the first big mistake. Okay? But anyway, uh, what I did was to shine that magnetron. Where, hey, oh, yeah. I shined it on a little uh, mic. We had, used to have little telephone receivers. And there's a horn, a magnetron. And since it was pulsed, out came a beautiful 1,000 uh, cycle note. And I said, well, maybe it's light pressure. But I didn't know what the heck you were going to do with a little, you know, a little, uh, with an, a little 1,000 um, cycle note. So I forgot about it. But then, when I was at Bell Labs in 1966, I went to a conference in... Uh, where in Arizona? Yeah, and there were two guys giving a talk. The names of Rawson and May. May was the professor. Rawson was uh, was a, a graduate student doing his thesis. He came to Bell Labs. He joined Gene Gordon's department. If you guys happen to know, anyway, uh, when he looked at a at, at a, a gas laser. 
Actually, it was an argon laser, you know, all nice, you see. Oh, yeah, he saw, he saw particles inside there moving around. And he called them runners and bouncers. Runners would run along this way, bouncers would go back and forth. And he did, what the hell is going on here? So he postulated, you know, he said, well, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's light pressure. Maybe it's a thermal effect. Maybe it's this. Nobody knew. Everybody was speculating. Well, I went home, and you know, this reminded me of my experiment on light pressure. I quickly calculated, and it was impossible. First of all, is light going from one mirror and the other mirror? If they will cancel out their motion, and then it couldn't possibly move. But here it is moving. So I said it's thermal. It was a, there was a little schmutz there, and it got uh, you know it got hot, and it started moving. And they would actually spin. These don't show the spinning, but okay. So they they concluded that there was light pressure too. They published another paper, Rawson and May. Rawson came to the labs. May stayed at uh, where in Canada? He was Canada Canadian. Okay. So that, the, but that alerted me to light pressure. I said to myself, if it is thermal, what would it take to make something using real light pressure? Now, light pressure is a hell of a lot smaller than thermal effects. So you have to do a, a much, you have to use a laser. You couldn't use an ordinary light. But now, Rene just clicks this in 1969. A year before I <laughs> published my first paper, this is a little animation that shows what happens if you have, say, one photon coming along and it hits a, a reflecting mirror. It bounces off and the mirror recoils. So it moves, you know, it moves. That's, that's what you expect. The force is, of course, minute. Now, if you focus, focus the laser more sharply and you have a transparent sphere, then, you know, tricky things begin to help. Yeah, yeah this shows it here. Rene shows it. Oh, when it hits to a side, it refracts through, comes out in the mo direction of the, you know, symmetrically in the momentum direction. And if it hits the other side, the particle goes the other way. If you flood it with particles, they all, there they are, flooded two particles, then it moves in the direction of the light because the two vectors, transverse vectors, co compensate. So when I calculate round numbers, suppose you have one watt on a mic one micron sphere, the acceleration, you know, is a hundred thousand times gravity, 100,000 times g. That would take off like a rocket. So that is an enormous pressure. And that is, well, we go back to that, <laughs> Rene, I wanted to say some more things. No, the, the next one, the next one. Yeah, I'm going to hear. Ah, well, okay. I'm saying it's an enormous force. If you were hit by one of these, by one of these balls, it would put a hole right through you. You'd be dead. Okay, but so we didn't use one watt. Uh, we used. Uh, I did an experiment with. Uh, well, I this was uh, even in the early days in 1969. Uh, what, go back. <laughs> yeah, you know, suppose the beam hits a particle, a sphere, and the sphere is off axis. You know, you move the uh, light around and you hit the sphere near the edge. What happens? Well, light is coming in. Here's the beam. It's the most intense on the center. That's a, a red, the, the lowest order mode, a, a TM00 mode. Well, uh, some light uh, 
it comes into array A, okay? It goes in, comes out symmetrically. That makes a force in the direction of men, F sub A. If the one's on the other side, you got F sub B. Notice that F sub A is bigger than F sub B. So you can resolve that into two components. One is along the light, and the other is at right angles. So you expect it to start moving this way. You expect it to start to moving towards the axis. Rene, can you show him what happens? There we are. Make it move. There it goes. It pulls to the axis. By that time, the force is symmetric. It stays there. It goes to the end of the cell. It hits the cell, and it stops. So that's a trap. We trap that particle. But it's mechanical. It's a ramming that against a wall. Of, 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 this is the output. This is a slide. Okay. But then after a while, you know, it dawned on me. If I put another beam on the other side that was symmetric, then the particle would stay fixed right at the equilibrium point at that little dot. And then, hold on, Rene found the notebooks. These are the notebooks that I wrote in, and this is my A. Ashkin, September 8th, 1969. Can you believe it? I have discussed this with Eric Giffen and Peter Wolf. He's our director. And says so before he even left on vacation. <laughs> so that's proof that we, we did actually do an experiment. I didn't dream that these, these tapes had existed. I, it was at the bottom of a cabinet in my, in my, in my, uh, in my room. Rene saw them and says, what is that? I said, I don't know. I looked at them, it's these old tapes. The tapes that we, Joe and I, used, we wanted to, you know, record the kinds of experiments we did, what kind of equipment we used, because we, if we wanted to set it up again, how did we, why did we do this, how did we do that? So we would turn on a, turn a tape on and talk. Okay. Okay. Oh yes. Well, okay. Here's uh, what did I say? Well, you know. We may, uh, uh, did I discuss an all optical trap? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here. If you have, if you, if you have, um, okay. If you have A and B, and they're equal power, and these are two Gaussian beams, it's focused at A and B, then, you know, the particle is symmetrical and it stays fit. Now, that is what we call a two-beam trap, but it's all optical. There is no mechanical forces here. Now, how many people knew that you could trap something by light alone? And this is low pressure. You know, this is a couple of milliwatts here. So I knew that this was already a pretty powerful thing. But still, it's two beams. And then you got to maneuver two beams around. OK. So I figured, OK, what are we going to do? We're going to take one beam away, we're going to shine the beam this way, and we're going to levitate. That's, you know what levitation is, OK? And this is optical levitation. But this little particle was sitting on a, there it is, sitting on a little glass slide. There's a little piezoelectric ceramic. That thing is sticking. If you turn it upside down, it doesn't fall. It sticks. So what we did, we hit, a, hit it with that piezo with a little pulse. It jumped up, broke the bond. Once it's in the light beam, up it goes. And how high does it go? Oh, that's low power, it doesn't move. You turn to high power, it still doesn't move. You kick it and it's free. And once it's free, it goes up. And it stops when light power matches the uh, gravity. So that's first optical levitation, 1971. Okay? Next, what is this? Oh, this is a, a trickier thing. We have a levitated particle, but here we have a feedback thing, circuit. What this, we just image this on the feedback uh, uh, sensor, and uh, suppose you push on, this, on the particle. 
well, there's a force it wants to move, but the sensor detect detects a difference, and the sensor changes the power so that it stays in the same place. So that power is an indication of how much force you are exerting. Well, that's a powerful thing, and what I did was to make what we call what I called an optical Millikan experiment. Millikan had already me measured the charge on the electron. Well, well what Millikan did was to, uh, he had uh, two electrodes like they show here, you know, plus and minus. I have a beam, I have a, but mine is optical. His was, uh, he was levitating with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, let's see, was it either a magnet or a, uh, um, or what? The particle was in a, uh, in a liquid, so if the particle was uh, not falling, it was in a liquid. Well, okay. Well, Milken, Milken's particle was there. He measured the charge. He got it wrong because he used the wrong viscosity of light. Uh, what else? Then oh, Milliken also. You use UV lights? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, after after a thing is levitated, you just flood it with UV light. You have a lamp there, so you make a lot of ions. Some are positive, some are negative, and then they're attracted to everything, including some some land on the sphere. Everyone who lands on the sphere changes the feedback, and the power is measuring the how much uh, a charge there is. So let's look. There, you see, this is neutral. This is the power to levitate. This is full power, and uh, we're flooded with electrons, and it, it's a charging time in minutes. And uh, you see that every time it collects an electron, it changes the uh, levitating power. So this is the number of electrons. We started with one positive charge. It went neutral. Then it became. One, two, three, and here it jumped twice. You know, it had to absorb two very quickly. But the point is, you don't see all these electrons are equal. That shows that an electron has one, a, one charge. Billiken found three electrons that were a third of an electron charge. He didn't report it. He said, no, no, that's crazy. No, no, that's a little accident. Let's forget it. So he, he, he put that, pushed that one under the rug. All right. Well, I'm going to tell you more about the, about the third of electron if I have a chance to. Because there's a guy at, uh, a guy, a student, of, who is a Bell Labs guy, Art Hebert, who, uh, his thesis, he measured... Uh, he measured the charge on the electron, and he found tons of guys that had one-third charge. No theorist could explain that. I think he probably should have won a Nobel Prize with his, uh, with his uh, professor. But, you know, he did a lot of stuff on superconductivity. But now let's get to the single beam trap. Uh, well, uh, you, you, you want to just go back very briefly to the other one, Rene? The other one, that's here. No, 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 before that, the next. <laughs> uh, here, this distance is, you know, many centimeters. You saw the picture, it's about 10 centimeters. So that, the, uh, this lens is just a, a loop lens, a, a cheap, cheapy lens. But what happens when you start increasing the numerical aperture. In other words, it makes it a stronger lens. The focus starts to move down. And when you're in a microscope, you know, if you're looking at a, with a 100x objective, and I have a 100x objective in here, I saw it. Everybody knows an objective. This is an ex exceptionally, a, it's, a, it's a Tice or a Nikon. This is a Nikon objective, a thousand bucks, okay? But the focus is just outside it, like this. This is a microscope, 
And if you have a laser, that is a trap. And I show you why. Because it's certainly hitting a little sphere. The sphere could be an electron. It could be an atom. It could be anything. Well, I'll, I'll show you what kinds of particles. It, and you could crap. But anyway, you go back to that, Ray, Rene. No, no, go, go. oh, here you go. So, the, at the focal point, uh, well, it's being pushed by, a, by the scattering force. I mean, it's being pushed along the axis. But there is a huge gradient, because this doesn't even do justice to it. This is a numerical aperture. It's written right on here. An A of uh, 1.4. That angle is really steep. And that angle makes a gradient so that, the, first of all, it doesn't go to the side, but it, bat, bat, it, ma it matches the, the scattering point, And there's an equilibrium point right at the focal, very close to the focal point. And that is the tweezer trap, the single beam gradient trap. And that's what I got the Nobel Prize for. Well, I, is that a good explanation? Oh, here. Here's, here's a microscope objective. I didn't show the full angle. The, the angle is even steeper for a numerical aperture. Well, anyway. On the bottom of the slide are a lot of in the cell. There are a lot of uh, spheres, glass spheres. Uh, for, first of all, we uh, uh, let's see. The, the, these are on the ground, Rene. Starts on the ground. Yeah, it's there. Turn up the power. Nothing happens because it's too weak. So you turn it up higher. It breaks loose. It goes up and it's pretty high power. Then it transfers it from there right into the uh, tweezer trap. Once it's in the tweezer trap, you can move it any old place you want. Huh? Let's see. Increasing the power, yeah. So it can be levitated, and that's tweezer. And we did that in 1966. Huh? 86. I said 80, 96, 86. Okay. And that was the time of very, and the, okay, you want to move on? Okay, and I wrote in my book, Joe Dietzik and I recently, oh, we set up a, 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 our microscope to trap uh, and levitate, uh, you know, uh, uh, with a YAG laser, okay, so, this shows the kind of stuff you can trap. This is a piece of junk. But we shine a laser, we shine the trap on it, and what happens? You, can you turn on a light? Uh, turn, 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 yeah, there was a video showing yeah. it. And this was... Uh, it's playing, they can see it, but we cannot see it. Oh, you can't see it because it's infrared. But, you know, you see there's a little bit of fluorescence there. No, no. It's a little, so you can, you, can, you can see where the trap is. Now, uh, this is a microscope. You have X and Y. You can wiggle it around. And if you cap another, cap to, capture another particle, you can wiggle the particle, but this guy is going to stay still. And I think the video shows that. Oh. Well, no, 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 no. Don't you, don't you show the other an animation on this? Yeah, but actually we cannot see it uh, right here. But I want to see it move. Yeah. <laughs> Can you turn it on? Is it possible? Why doesn't it go? It's playing on this TV. Oh, it's playing there. You guys can see it. Do you see the particle moving back and forth? But that guy is staying fixed. Okay. Now here is a very interesting particle. This is a paramecium. You must know what paramecium are. There are there are single cell organisms, and they're about uh, you know they're macroscopic. It's a good fraction of a of a of a, of a millimeter. They're 500, 300. And this is the length, you know. Okay, and they're filled with internal organisms, organelles. Now here was here's a picture of a actual baramecium taken under our microscope. 
And all those little white dots are organelles. One is the nucleus, another one is a food vacuole, okay? And we put the trap right on this guy here, okay? With the red dot. So he's in the trap, but the guy doesn't know we're trapping his guts. He keeps the cilia working and he starts moving. Look what happens. Turn on, turn on. You can see it. It's turned on now. Oh, it's turned on. I can't see it moving. Is it moving? Yeah. It moves to the back. Then it hits the cell wall. And the cell wall rips it out of the trap. And it recoils because the guts are kind of squishy. It's, uh, and they jump back, but not to the original place. That tells you something about the, the, the mechanical properties of the guts of the cell. So that's, and, and can you do that again? Yeah, I mean, you, you, I, you see you do it several times. Do you see it bouncing back? That's really, and boy, when we saw that, we knew that we could manipulate. Here's a, here's a tobacco mosaic virus. Do you know what that is? That's a lo this thing here is a tobacco, it's a rod. People say it's not even alive, it's just a chunk of protein. And these little, it's a, it's a spiral, and each little dot is sort of an, a, an angstrom away, but this whole thing is about a, a, a micron, okay? And here, Rene, show, put the, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a virus here, but uh, Rene put the, uh, the uh, red, uh, he, he's just marked it just so that you see it, but then we'll see it move. Can you make it move? Well, what it does is that the trap slides along the, the length because it, there's, there's no change in length so that it's, 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 it's not trapping at the mid. It, when it gets to the end, then it catches and then the end hangs down and it wheels around and... Okay, do you see that? Okay, I can't see it here, but... Uh, okay, and that's a pic... Okay, now... I went to, uh, to, the, uh, to the vegetable store and I bought uh, some green stuff. I bought uh, onion cells. Well, I ought to think it was scallion cells. Now here, this is... This, these are... This is a, a cell, this is the wall. You know, this, you peel this off. You, do you guys take biology? I took biology when I was uh, a freshman in high school. And we used to look at, uh, at the onion cells. And you see the, you know, you see the, uh, the guts flowing around. But they have the chloroplast, it's green. Now here are the chloroplasts, these are green. These things are, all, these little, uh, dark circles. What's what's that? Right? Yeah. Well, let's wait till it goes away. It's it's going to the great swamp. No, oh, they didn't have build an airport there. It's going to Newark. Okay. Now, if you put the trap on one of these chloroplasts and try to move it, it doesn't go. But the guts are, are, are a bit squishy. So when you pull it, it moves a small amount. Then if you pull any further, it leaves. That shows that uh, you know, there's tension in there. So what do you do? You pull it a little bit till it, till it moves just a little bit, and then you wait. Then the, the, the uh, tension relaxes to the point where you can pull it a little more. So you pull it and then you wait. You pull it and you wait. First thing you know, you're pulling this chloroplast right off the wall. You're taking the end and you're attaching it on the side. You try to attach it to the side, it doesn't stick. But you leave it there and wait. Then the gut starts to flow. Uh, that's not this yet, I'm talking about the, uh, about the, uh, about the chloroplast. Then it attaches itself. And you can move, move all of us. So you can do operations. And that's a powerful thing. Who knows what's going to happen when you move the nucleus? Why is the nucleus where it is? It must, nature must have a reason for it. 
So if you move it and you see something change, maybe it dies in two, in, in two hours, who knows? But anyway, so that's one of the applications. Now, application of optical ma uh, manipulation, there's an, an amoeba, a giant amoeba. It's multicellular. It has various nuclei. It has all these tendrils sticking out. And if you put a trap on one of these guys and move it, the thing stretches out. It makes new channels. Can you show that here? Yeah, I can't see it, but you, the light pulls out a new channel. And particles move along them. It's most marvelous. In fact, when we saw it, Joe and I had our, our, our voice machine on, and, 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 and I think I say, uh, look at that. What, you want to turn that on? Don't you hear the voice? Yeah. The turn the voice, voice on. Voice. No voice. I wanted to hear myself talk in 1988. <laughs> the next one is supposed to talk. So the next okay, one. let's see if the next one does. Yeah. Go, go to the next one. Oh, this is a sperm. There were some, there were some doctors from Newark College of Engineering. In fact, one of his sons worked for Steve Block, a guy at Stanford, and he heard about uh, that we could manipulate things. He said, well, let's, let's manipulate sperm, see how fast they are, how powerful they are. So they collected some sperms. This is a sperm. You know, it has a head and it has a tail, and the tail wiggles around like that. In fact, here I catch a one. If you turn it, can you turn the animation on there? Is it going? Well, you should see it wiggling. and It's in the trap, but it's stuck. Okay? Well, actually, you can take this and you can fertilize an egg. You can puncture a hole in the egg and you can do that with a, with a pulse of a laser and then shove the head in there and you, and you have a, a growing embryo. Okay? 1988. Well, okay, let's, so that's another application. There, there are tons of... Go on, Renee, let's see what we have. Biological application. Oh, now, this is courtesy of Steve Block. Steve Block is a guy at Stanford. In fact, uh, he came to visit me. I went to visit him. He was, a, he was a postdoc at Harvard for a guy called Howard Berg. Now, Howard Berg, I don't know if you know him, but if you read physics today, he wrote a beautiful paper on uh, um, uh, motors, uh, motors of E. coli bacteria, you know, these are in your gut, they have e a lot of E. coli to make you sick too, but anyway, uh, the motor has all kinds of complicated parts that almost look like gears, and it turns, and he was an expert. And st uh, Steve Block, I worked with Howard Burr. But Steve Block read our paper, or he heard a, a talk by us, in which we claimed that, you know, we were manipulating things with light. He said, well, we should use that. That's better than, uh, than, uh, than anything else. This, is, this, is a, this was the optical tweezers. Howard Berg says, oh, we've got more important things to do. We've got to do this. We've got... So, Steve, so they didn't do the experiment. Joe and I gave us an opportunity because, you know, he didn't know much biology. I didn't know. But we, we, we went out to the lab's pond in the summertime. We were fishing out uh, Spirogyra. We were fishing out... Uh, all kinds of little things, and we were taking them up into the lab, and we and we liked it outside. You know, the sun is shining. But they had a beautiful farm pond on uh, at uh, not at Crawford Hill, but at the Black Box. That was a that was an old farm. Okay. Well, so we uh, we were able to then because these guys weren't doing it. 
They were really professionals. We were total amateurs. But anyway, we found we could catch almost anything. What can any respect of the shape of the shape? This shows how later on Steve Block started doing these experiments on his own when he became a uh, uh, he became an assistant professor. I don't know. I think he went to Princeton. He was at Princeton, and he looked. There's something called motor molecules. These are molecules that pull things. Everything that moves inside has to be driven by something. There's a molecule. And here is the motor. It's a kind of kinesin motor. And you see it has two little feet. And this is a microtubule. That's a, that's a rod that's in the shell. And this thing walks along it. It looks like two feet. It's walking. And then you attach, there's a long, there's a long uh, strand, and you attach that to a bead. And the bead is in a trap. You see there's a, this weak bead? So it walks along, and it's carrying this load, the bead. It looks like, you know, a guy walking along. And this is real life. This is how things move inside the cells. There are a whole class of motors. Joe and I studied uh, something called myosin in, later on in, in a big amoeba. We'll look at that. But anyway, when, you, when it's walking along, every time it takes a strip, it step, it, in time it pulls it. So you see here are the various steps. These are different runs. Look, they're identical. This one is just like that one, is just like that one. So this is real stuff. And he measures how strong it is. And the size of the step, the size of the step is what? Eight nanometers. Very, very accurately. Hand over hand in discrete steps. Kinesin walks. Now that is pretty marvelous. OK, next. Ah, years later. We're practically at modern times. DNA has been discovered. And then there's another molecule that is always associated with DNA, and it's called RNA polymerase. It works on DNA. What, what happens here? The DNA at one end is attached to that bead, and then you make a very strong trap. So this guy is dead still. So you're holding this end. The other end is attached. There's a bead in this trap. And you see it's partly pulled out. So it's exerting tension on that. And here is an, a, a, a RNA polymerase mo molecule. And it's pulling it along this DNA strip. And as it's pulling it, it's making a replica. That is like. How a cell, how cells grow. That's how, uh, you know. That's how life works. Now, here's the, all the little red thing is the strand that's an exact replica of the DNA. So you're replace, re, you're you're, you're replicating uh, the uh, the DNA. Now, it does it very slowly. We're going to see an animation from Steve Block adapted with permission. He's very happy to show this. Uh, and this is 30 times faster than it's actually happening. So he did this very slowly. When, when we're going to see it later. When, when it's moving so slowly, you can't even see it. Yeah. I thought it was all junk. I, think it's it's I said, you know, he's finally reached the, uh, he's reached the uh, breaking points. <laughs> Steve Block is this. But it was all real. And then look, when, when it's 30 times faster, watch it move. It's reproducing, it's, it's making a, a replica of the DNA strand. You want to move it along, yeah. Renee? Yeah. I hope you see it. Oh, and this is what you see when you have a single strand. This is time. And this is, uh, what is that? Uh, what does that say? 
extension, yeah. Well, that looks, I don't see many steps there, but you're going to pick on, now Rene is going to expand it ten times. Oh, there are changed it, there are a few steps. Another ten times. All right? There are steps here. It's kind of shaky, but each step is 3.4 angstroms. An angstrom is just about the size of an atom. So this thing is crawling along, atom to atom, reproducing it. Guess what? Sometimes it makes a mistake. That's a cancer. So what does the cell do? The cell, nature, I don't know how nature does it, it goes back, it throws out the old, the old, uh, the, 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 you know, it, it acquired a, a wrong uh, molecule, so it throws, or atom, it throws it out, replaces it with a new one, and then moves on. Well, that all happens, and you know, I saw this, this business where he moves backward and it shakes, I said, that's crazy, nothing in nature looks like that, but it's all true. I think that guy deserves a Nobel Prize for this. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I, I, well, he, he is such a smart guy. And, and you know, oh, not only that, to do, see that, you have to have a stability on the size of the single, a single uh, angstrom. So, he had to do his experiment, he had to stabilize the apparatus to the point where it wasn't shaking down to the thickness of, a, of, a, of, a, of an angstrom. Now that is hard to do. If a trolley car worked down, went, went rumbling down the street, his, his apparatus would shake, he couldn't do the experiment. So his students had to work at midnight. And students don't like to work at midnight. <laughs> So he had to pay them a lot. He says, I paid them $10,000. Can you imagine as a student? I couldn't raise a hundred bucks when I was a student. Well, they had, he paid them $10,000 and they still didn't want to come. So he tells me, you know, I'm losing my students. I'm down to two students. And one of them is going to leave me too because they don't want to work at night time. So the poor guy has no students left. That's because they're building a new biology building at Stanford, very close to his building. And whenever they build it, and whenever the tro trolley cars or the subway goes, he can't, uh, he can't, uh, can't operate. So that's Steve Block, and that's, that's a tremendous application. And there are lots and lots. And another thing. It's so easy to make a trap. What is the trap? The trap is, a, is, a, is an objective like this and a light beam. This has a very short focal length. And you know, why does it, when, you, when it has a, a, you know, when it has a very convergent beam, it almost looks like, the, and the gradient is backwards. So this is backward light pressure. Who in his right mind would think that when you shine a light this way, the particle goes backwards? That's the scattering force is this way. Well, there is a scattering force, but there's a big backward gradient, and that matches the scattering force, and this traps the particle, so it always works. Suppose you have a big particle like this, huge and you stick this somewhere in the middle and turn it on. It's trapped. Why? When you move it around, you, you know there's nothing around there, so it, so it doesn't do anything. But when you get to the edge, then there's a big change in the index of refraction. So the gradient force catches that and you pull it. Now either it stretches out into a rod like a reticular mixer, or it moves around like tobacco mosaic wires or a piece of schmutz in there, but it always works. Now, people say, that's too simple. Oh, everything, well, how did you discover this? Well, it's simple, but that's the old virtue of it. If it was so complicated that you had to do all kinds of maneuvering, 
Well, nobody would use it. Now everybody uses it. And I support a good fraction of the, uh, of the research in uh, physics. You know, guys use it for everything. Atoms, oh, you can make Bose condensates. Well, after we, after we did our 1986, we did this trapping experiment, what happened? Well, the guys uh, at uh, MIT and other places invented the Mott trap, magnetic, mag magneto optic trap. And it was a big trap, so it ca caught on a lot of electrons. They said, oh, your trap only cast caught 500 the first time. Oh, it's going to trap thousands. Well, you don't want to trap thousands. If you want to study a single atom, you want to catch a single atom and turn it around and look at it. Or you want to make a gold Bose condensate. You don't want uh, a magnetic field because you can't, if you change the magnetic field, and they change the magnetic field, then uh, the resonance moves around. There's a, there's a Zeeman effect. So you don't want the magnetic field. But for 10 years, these guys, you know, they found another experiment using a magnetic trap. And this, they said, oh, this is the greatest trap in the world. And the Nobel per committee, you know what they said when Steve Chu won his trap? won his prize, they said uh, these, these guys had to invent the magnetic trap to overcome the difficulties of the tweezer trap. And the tweezer trap was the only guy that could show the Bose condensation. So how do you think I feel? <laughs> well, you, if you want to know, go read that book. Go, no, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. I wrote an afterword which summarizes what happened after, uh, you know, after working for all these years on trapping. And then I say uh, in that book uh, exactly why, you know, they wasted, they basically wasted 10 years of, uh, they couldn't make a Bose condensate. But Bose condensates are used for all kinds of things. You can show superconductivity, you can do all kinds of experiments with Bose condensates. Well, okay, here are the guys I work with. There's Joe. I've said a lot about Joe. Yeah, he's, he's dear to my heart. And there's John Bjorkholm, the first guy I hired. Now, I thought that John Bjorkholm, well, you know, when we did our first experiment of trapping atoms, John Bjorkholm calculated all the parameters. John Bjorkholm and I did experiments which showed that we were trapping in two dimensions. I don't, I don't think we did, never showed this, this business where we pulled the atoms in. We didn't show it. Well, you can read that in my book. And here's, here's me, and there's Roger. He's one of the fathers of nonlinear optics. He's the member of the National Academy of Engineering. Well, I nominated him. How did I get him in? It turns out the Russians, the Russians, he was in the Russian Academy of Sciences. So I said, if the, he's good enough for the Russians, he's good enough for us. So they, 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 uh, they uh, accepted him. And now, and there's Eric. Well, you know about Eric Kippen. He worked with House, and you know he he went to MIT, and he was he's still there. He's just retired. He has a few students now. About all the animations that done by by uh, Carla Munoz and uh, how do you pronounce that? Wei Wei. I, I've never met I've never met Wei Wei, and the presentation and the, these other guys have all worked on it. So I guess that's the end of the talk. <laughs>
the tent. Uh, we actually need, do you have an optical tweezer that could sort of keep the tent in one place? <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to go to the uh, musical performance and then we'll do Q&A during lunch because you have a lot of admirers that would love to come and say hello to you. So uh, why don't we do that? Because we, we fear for the integrity of the structure and the people in it. So we're going to move ahead and I'm going to introduce uh, Dunal Hernan who's going to explain uh, the origin of the piece that you're about to hear, which is in honor of art, and then we'll move to lunch and do Q&A there. Or oh, we have an unveiling to do as well, I guess. Yeah. Over to Dunal. Thank you. Um, I'm going to say a few words while we wait for our musicians to come in. They actually are not in stealth mode. They're coming in from the uh, side exit here as we speak. So what we decided to do, Art, was to commission a piece of music that celebrated your scientific accomplishments and to also commission a piece of music that... Uh, celebrates your creativity and uh, the creativity you showed in coming up with these immense solutions to these scientific problems. So what you're going to hear is um, one of your favorite pieces of music by Schubert, one of your favorite composers we've been told. It's a chamber music piece um, and we're going to manipulate it, fuse it, augment it in a typically Bell Labs way where you'll get to hear the, the piece traditionally but you're also going to get to hear it in a new way by using some of the modern technology that we've been developing in Bell Labs. So just while we're waiting to get going, I'll give you a little bit of context around what you're about to experience, and then I'm going to invite the composer up to share more information. So in Bell Labs, throughout our history, and certainly in modern times, we have a very strong legacy and history of collaborating with the creative community and the artistic community. And the reason for that is it brings an entire new dimension to the way we think about our research and technology development and it really puts the human at the center of everything we do. And in particular in this case you're going to experience and get a sense of just one of those collaborations we have with Seth Kluwet who's a composer, he's the director of the Computer <laughs> Music Center in Colombia um, and he's also an artist in resident with us and the musicians are from the International Contemporary Ensemble, one of the best known ensembles globally for experimental new music. And in our exploration in this program where we collaborate with the artistic community, we are looking to develop new ways to help people communicate. And we're looking to break down the barriers that exist between people because of the limitations in the spoken word and the written word as we communicate today. And we're trying to use new technology in an interesting way to break down those barriers and relieve some of these tensions that exist in the world. So in this exploration with Seth and with the International Contemporary Ensemble and along this path and this journey we're on, a number of interesting new approaches to music composition, music performance have emerged. And you're going to get a real sense of that here today. And as I said, this was commissioned specifically for you, Art, to commemorate your creativity and all of your accomplishments. So with that, I'm going to invite Seth up to share a little bit of information on the piece, what motivates the work, and give you a sense of what you'll experience. Thanks, Duno. I just want to say what a pleasure and an honor it is to be here, uh, getting an opportunity to do this uh, for you, Art, and also, uh, you know, in my in my two years here at Bell Labs, uh, as, as an acoustician, uh, when I'm not a composer, uh, optics has always seemed like m magic to me. So, uh, so to try to think of metaphors that would work within a musical domain, uh, we've put together a bit of a hybrid. Uh, we're going to start by performing a piece of uh, Franz Schubert. Uh, called uh, The Shepherd on the Rock uh, for clarinet, uh, vocalist, and piano. Um, and what I tried to do was think about um, what could I do to Schubert, already a wonderful, great, amazing composer, uh, that had a relationship to your research. And so what I, what I developed was a little algorithm uh, that listens to the Schubert about two-thirds of the way through. Two-thirds of the Schubert, you won't hear any processing at all. There's nothing at all going on. And then about the last third of the piece, um, Schubert will start to uh, be listened to by a little piece of software running on my computer uh, that's uh, taking a running uh, fast Fourier transform uh, looking for the spectral centroid of the, of, the, of the sum total of all of the parts. That's sort of my metaphor for the very liber... Uh, it's a, a poetic license for a metaphor <laughs> for, the, for the laser. Um, and, then, uh, and then I started to think, what would happen if I trapped pitches in the, in the, in the optical trap, right? This is the audible trap. How could I tra trap pitches and then rotate them around, move them, uh, spin them out, uh, and then uh, have them enhance the, the Schubert? So you'll hear uh, from these instruments, there are 3D printed loudspeaker inserts uh, playing back down into the instruments, and the instruments 
own acoustics are modulating the sound of the of the tones uh, that are being produced, generated by the by the instruments on that side. Uh, we'll then, uh, you know, round of applause, and uh, uh, this wonderful wind trio will play uh, a piece of mine that's been uh, adapted to have some echoes of Schubert. Uh, play through some of the loudspeakers uh, in the piece. I myself, uh, uh, you know, when you're a young composer, uh, you're often asked, you know, are you a Mozart composer or a Beethoven composer? And I always hated that dichotomy because Mozart, the great genius, and uh, everything just flows right out of him. And Beethoven, the toiler who's just like plugging away, working, working, working hard. And then Schubert, uh, who works in isolation for the vast majority of his life. And then at the very end, a month before he passes away, when he composes this piece, uh, he finally receives the recognition that he deserves uh, uh, so rightly for this work. And so I've always thought of myself as a bit of a Schubert composer, hoping one day to receive that recognition, but being <laughs> totally, totally happy toiling away in uh, isolation until then. Uh, so thank you very much for your work, and we hope you enjoy what we present.
if uh, Stephen Block doesn't win a Nobel Prize for the, uh, uh, the, uh, po the, the uh, polymerase RNA uh, work, which is, a, is incredible work as well. But anyway, that sort of concludes the, uh, the outdoor part, outdoor slash indoor. Uh, and what we've got one more thing left to do. Seymour uh, is sort of jumping up and down. We've got one more thing left to do. We have to unveil art. Now, you, you may think you, we've unveiled art, uh, but in fact, we're going to go down here, and I'm just going to explain a bit. This circle, which is sort of occluded here, is actually the Nobel Laureate Circle. There are now nine of them. This is art circle on which the stage stands, and uh, over time in, in the summer, we put out uh, a sort of uh, a picnic area and an umbrella, and it, it's, it's a wonderful place to come and hang out. We have to unveil the plaque that will actually be at the foot of the circle here. So, Art, you have to come on up, and whoever wants to assist, Rene, Aline. And then we all uh, head in for uh, lunch in, in a more stable structure, at least we hope. Rene, come on down as well. Uh, Charlie, you're going Okay.